lecture eleven part three of christian patience by william bernard ullathorne this librivox recording is in the public domain lecture eleven on patience in prayer part three in his moral exposition of the book of job st gregory the great has given us such a solid explanation of the value of interior trials that we gladly give his reflections at length the text on which the great pontiff builds his comment is the words of the messenger to job while thy sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in the house of their elder brother a violent wind came on a sudden from the side of the desert and shook the four corners of the house and it fell upon thy children and they are dead and i alone have escaped to tell thee job chapter one verses eighteen and nineteen upon this st gregory observes that the interior house of the soul is built up in the four cardinal virtues and within are the other virtues children of the heart that mutually feed each other justice fortitude prudence and temperance frame a house for the spirit of god then the spirit of god prepares the house of the soul against her several trials by tempering her with seven virtues with wisdom against folly with understanding against stupidity with counsel against precipitation with fortitude against fear with knowledge against ignorance with piety against hard-heartedness and with the fear of the lord against pride yet sometimes whilst the soul is upheld in the plenteous abundance of the divine gift were that gift left constantly with us giving us always sweet enjoyment we should forget from whom the gift comes and think it our own it is therefore useful that sometimes this gift should be withdrawn to check our presumption and to show us how weak we are when we lose it for a time we learn to know whence our good comes and that we have not the power to keep it sometimes to teach us humility temptation rushes upon us and that with a violence that strikes our wisdom into folly not knowing how to deal with the temptation we become troubled as to how we can meet the pressure of evil but by this very folly the heart is taught prudence our momentary folly makes us more humble and therefore more truly wise and the wisdom lost in a manner for the time is henceforth held in greater security sometimes after the understanding has ascended to sublime things there comes a dull obtuseness that sinks the mind down to things low and vile and even inferior truths leave the mind that recently soared aloft on rapid wings yet this very stupidity that comes upon the temporary loss of the mental powers saves the understanding for the heart is humbled and is therefore more justly strengthened to understand what is truly sublime sometimes whilst rejoicing in the steady counsel that rules our actions there comes a crisis that hurries us into thoughtless precipitation so that whilst we imagine that all was well regulated within us our interior becomes devastated with confusion yet this very confusion teaches us to beware of ascribing our counsel to our own virtue and after we have returned to the gift of counsel that seemed lost we hold to that counsel with greater firmness sometimes whilst bravely despising adversities some new trouble beyond what we looked for comes upon us and the soul is struck with unusual fear yet after suffering this confusion the soul learns to whom she should ascribe the strength that sustains her under tribulations and in proportion to the danger she has incurred of losing her fortitude she will adhere more firmly to her divine strengthener sometimes whilst rejoicing in the knowledge of divine things the mind becomes torpid and struck as it were with blindness 
yet though the eye of the mind is closed in ignorance for a time it afterwards opens to true knowledge for this visitation of blindness instructs us in the right kind of knowledge and teaches us from whom true knowledge comes sometimes when all things seem to be disposed religiously within us and we congratulate ourselves on being filled with pious feelings a sudden hardness comes upon us yet whilst made sensible of the natural hardness of our heart we learn from whom we receive the gift of piety and after its partial extinction that piety returns more perfect and we love it the more for having lost it for a time sometimes when the soul is rejoicing in the holy fear of god she becomes suddenly stiffened with temptations to pride yet roused by the dread of losing the fear of god she bends down anew to humility and in proportion to her dread of losing a virtue so momentous she receives it back with greater solidity when the house of job was overwhelmed the seven sons died when the strong wind of temptation troubles the conscience for the gaining of self-knowledge the virtues born of the heart are overwhelmed yet those sons of the heart still live through the spirit within them although externally dead to the sensibilities for though the hour of trial troubles the virtues in a moment through the perseverance of right intention they live secure in the root of the soul with the sons of job their three sisters were overwhelmed when heavy trials come it will sometimes befall us that charity is troubled in the heart hope is shaken with alarm and faith is assaulted with questionings for at times our love of our creator will languish under the thought that we are made to suffer beyond our strength and yielding more to fear than we ought the confidence of our hope becomes enfeebled at times also the mind stretches to immense questions and faith suffers fatigue as though it were failing yet these daughters of grace are alive though they seem overwhelmed for when conscience seems to say that faith hope and charity have almost failed they are kept alive in the sight of god by the perseverance of right intention the servant who brought these tidings to job alone escaped amidst our great trials one thing remains safe and secure and that is the light and discretion by which we distinguish what is just from what is unjust in the wonderful dispensation under which we live the soul is stricken at times with the sense of guiltiness were a man never to feel his weakness he would imagine himself the lord of his powers but when shaken by the inrush of temptations he becomes fatigued beyond what suffices him there is shown him the fortress of humility where he will find an ample protection against his enemies and from the very fear that his weakness may bring him to a fall he receives a strength that enables him to stand with firmness he not only learns from his trials from whom he receives his power but knows with what watchfulness that power must be preserved often when temptation might be easily defeated in the combat the conceit of self-security brings him to a fall for when the soul is dissolved in idleness she becomes an easy prey to the corrupter but when the divine piety disposes in such a manner that temptation shall not rush with vehemence upon us but is only permitted to approach with moderated steps for our instruction this is granted that we may arm ourselves with caution against the coming foe and job said the lord hath given the lord hath taken away blessed be the name of the lord see how the trials of job instruct him in what he has received he confesses the bounty of god in what is taken from him to the perturbation of his fortitude he confesses the power of god yet fortitude itself is not taken from him it is only fatigued with perturbation 
from moment to moment his soul is shaken with the fear of losing it but growing ever more humble through that fear his humility saves him from losing his fortitude no one has treated the subject of patience in prayer and in the conduct of life with greater breadth clearness and fullness than st catherine of siena and it must be remembered that in the decree of her canonization her doctrine was pronounced to have been not acquired but infused with a summary of what this profoundly enlightened saint dictated on the subject we will close this instruction she listens to the eternal truth and then speaks to souls in the old testament when sacrifice was offered to god there came a fire that drew the victim to him and made it acceptable so the sweet truth sends the fire of the holy spirit to draw to him the sacrifice of desire whereby the soul makes the oblation of herself to god and he says to the soul knowest thou not that all the pains thou endurest or canst endure in this life are insufficient to punish the least of thy sins an offence against god the infinite good requires an infinite satisfaction but all the pain sent thee in this life are not sent for punishment some are sent for the correction of the offending child this however is true that the soul can satisfy by her desires when they are accompanied with true contrition and displeasure of sin true contrition satisfies both for sin and punishment not because of the limited sufferings endured but because of the infinite desire of god which accompanies them for he who is infinite would have infinite love and infinite sorrow he would have infinite sorrow for the offence of god and also of our neighbour but souls have infinite desires when they are made infinite through their union with god in love and in grief for having offended him whatever sufferings they endure whether spiritual or corporal receive an infinite merit through being moved by the holy spirit of love although the acts themselves are limited in time and intensity the virtue of endurance prevails because it is accompanied by this infinite desire together with contrition and detestation of sin this truth is demonstrated by st paul if i speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity i am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal and if i should have prophecy and should know all mysteries and have not charity i am nothing and if i should distribute all my goods to feed the poor and if i should deliver my body to be burned and have not charity it profiteth me nothing one corinthians chapter thirteen verses one through three the glorious apostle thus demonstrates that no limited acts or sufferings can satisfy unless seasoned with the unlimited desires of charity every virtue has life and avails through jesus christ the only begotten son of god crucified and avails as far as the soul draws love from him with which to follow his steps in the virtues in this way they avail and in no other in this way sufferings satisfy for sin that is from the sweet and unitive love obtained from the sweet knowledge of the divine goodness and through bitter contrition of heart derived from the knowledge of thyself and thy sins this knowledge produces hatred of self of sin and of sensuality the effect of which is to account oneself deserving of suffering and undeserving of consolation thou seest then how by contrition of heart by love of patience and by true humility thy sufferings should be borne with patience through humility whilst thou accountest thyself worthy of suffering and unworthy of consolation thou wilt then ask to suffer as a satisfaction for thy offences against thy creator 
and wilt desire to know the sovereign truth that thou mayest love him but the way to gain perfect knowledge and to taste the eternal truth is this that thou never depart from the knowledge of thyself but abide in the valley of humility where thou shalt know god within thee and shalt draw from that knowledge what is needful for thee no virtue can have life without charity nor without humility which is the nurse of charity thou shalt humble thyself in the knowledge of thyself and shalt see that thy being is not from thyself but from god who loved thee before thou wast and through unspeakable love recreated thee in grace and washed thee and recreated thee in the blood of his only begotten son shed with great fire of love this love makes the truth known to every one who but lifts the cloud of self-love from off him through self-knowledge then will the soul ascend to the knowledge of god with unspeakable love yet this love will keep the soul in continual suffering because it is a love that sorrows in the knowledge of the truth and suffers exceedingly because of one's sins and ingratitude and because of the blindness of those who love not god yet this is not an afflicting sorrow not a sorrow that withers the soul but an enriching sorrow the soul thus satisfies for her sins and for the sins of the other servants of god and her sufferings may suffice because she receives the fruits of life through the virtue of charity patience is the queen of the soul she is seated on the rock of fortitude she conquers and is never conquered this virtue is the marrow of charity by its presence we know whether the garment of charity with which we are clothed is the true nuptial garment or not if this garment have rents in it it is an imperfect garment and impatience will escape through the rents the other virtues may be for a time concealed or may seem to be perfect when in reality they are imperfect but thou o patience canst not be hidden let this sweet patience this marrow of charity be in the soul and it will demonstrate that all the other virtues are there and living in perfection but if patience be absent that absence will show that all the other virtues are imperfect and not yet united to the most holy cross patience is conceived of self-knowledge through the knowledge of god's infinite goodness is born of self-hatred and is anointed with true humility nothing is refused to the virtue of patience neither the honour of god nor the salvation of souls it enjoys them continually look at the glorious martyrs how many souls were given to their patience death brought them life they raised the dead they drove mortal sin away from souls the world exhibited its grandeur the lords of the world put forth their power yet they could not prevail against the martyrs so strong were they in the sweet power of patience this virtue is a light placed on a candlestick it is the glorious fruit of tears united with the love of god and of our neighbour it partakes of the immaculate lamb with anxious and crucified desires the pain suffered by this virtue is not afflicting even though suffered for the offences committed against our divine creator because loving patience destroys all fear and self-love it is consoling because founded in charity it brings joy because it is the demonstrative proof that god dwells by grace in the soul impatience springs from one of two causes from spiritual death when the soul is in mortal sin from imperfection of life when the root of self-love is not mortified those imperfect souls live by grace but they are tender about themselves sensitive from sensuality and have a soft compassion for their own weakness they expect other people to compassionate them 
and suffer when they are not compassionated this leads them to murmuring and to judging the wills of other persons all this comes from self-love and impatience is the proof of it they love their own way and what tongue can tell the troubles of self-will in these self-willed persons the eye of the understanding is obscured their faith the very pupil of the eye is clouded with self-love and they are unfaithful to their light the impatience that follows makes them disobedient this weakens their judgment and this again leads them to murmuring although they live in grace their souls are imperfect their self-love obscures their sight and their virtues are imperfect for they accept not the discipline of god with patience nor even with becoming reverence nor with the love which god has given them they do not properly understand that what god sends them or permits is for their sanctification and is consequently to be accepted with gratitude but this disobedience to god's will results from pride which chooses to serve god in their own way and not in his way for if we believed in very truth that everything except sin proceeds from god and that he wills nothing but what is for our good a truth we taste in the blood of christ crucified did we believe this in very truth and were not warped from it by this tenderness for ourselves we should be reverentially obedient and accept whatever god sends us and should judge that what he sends us is sent in love and for our good but because we are unfaithful to this belief we suffer pains and troubles and become impatient under the pains that we suffer impatience is the habitual outcome of infidelity to what god ordains for us we can see this in others and can be disedified with it such persons can be quite content that superiors should direct things in their own way as a rule but they are pained and troubled if their own private ways are contradicted whence comes all this pain if they had no conflict between their nature and their living grace they would not suffer but they are weak and their infirmity is owing to their not having patience in their charity instead of humbling themselves beneath the mighty hand of god and receiving as they can do what comes from him they will have their pains and fatigues at a time in a place and in a way that they choose for themselves if they cannot pay their debt of duty like other people they should at least pay their debt of patience god requires nothing of us beyond what we are able to do but he always requires charity and always requires patience to endure the pains and toils that he sends us o patience how delightful thou art to those who have thee what hope thou bringest to those who possess thee thou art the sovereign of the soul thou art the corrector of sensuality but let anger or impatience appear and with the two-edged sword of hatred and love anger is cut down pride is severed away by the roots and impatience is made to vanish clothed in thy garment of self-knowledge as with sunlight and casting keen rays of ardent charity on those who would injure thee thou heapest coals of fire on their heads in the might of self-knowledge thou art begirt with the virtues as with the stars of heaven and after the night of self-knowledge comes the day of great light and the sun's high fervor clothing thee in beautiful robes who then will not love this beautiful patience that endures all things for christ crucified where shall we find this valiant virtue of patience we shall find it says st catherine where we find charity and find it in the same way we shall find it in the blood of christ crucified where amidst the torments of the cross no murmur is heard but that of prayer and pardon 
there shall we find the patience that bears all our iniquities and infirmities and that gives the grace of patience to all who live in that blood we shall find it in the blood that is embraced and possessed by the eternal divinity to whom at hearing the soul is filled with the holy fire of charity and with the patience by which that blood was shed we shall find that patience in the unspeakable love with which god has loved us and with which he has endured us end of lecture eleven part three Lecture 12, Part 1 of Christian Patience by William Bernard Ullathorne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lecture 12 On the Cheerfulness of Patience, Part 1. That you may walk worthy of God in all things pleasing, strengthened with all might according to the power of His glory in all patience and long-suffering with joy colossians chapter one verses ten and eleven there can be no better proof of a healthy soul than habitual cheerfulness christian cheerfulness is that modest hopeful and peaceful joy which springs from charity and is protected by patience it is as far removed from the bacchic outbursts of sensual mirth and the egotistical thrills of self-applauding laughter as from melancholy gloom or self-absorbing sadness of all which disorderly excesses true cheerfulness is the gentle but most decided adversary it is the well-regulated vigor of spiritual life that throws off all morbid humors and depressing influences refusing them a lodgment in the soul devoted to god cheerfulness gives freedom to our thoughts and a generous spirit to our actions it makes our services to god acceptable and our services to our neighbor grateful it is revealed in holy scripture that god loveth the cheerful giver two corinthians chapter nine verse seven and as ecclesiasticus says he that adoreth god with joy shall be acceptable ecclesiasticus chapter thirty five verse twenty as this spirit of cheerfulness is born of charity and patience it is charity that expands the soul with grateful affection and infuses sweetness and patience that keeps the soul in peace and protects the spring of cheerfulness from being troubled or diminished it is observed by st thomas that although spiritual joy is not of itself a virtue it is the fruit produced by the virtues and is chiefly the fruit of charity flowing from the love of god but whilst the great theologian assigns the chief cause of spiritual joy to charity he gives the due share of that joy to patience we must distinguish he says between the virtue and the fruit of patience as a habit of the soul patience is a virtue but the pleasure which flows from the exercise of patience is its fruit and especially in this respect that it preserves the soul from sadness hence st paul places patience among the fruits of the holy ghost this cheerfulness of soul springs from the divine good which god has planted within us which acts within us of which we are partakers and with which our affections are united hence purity of conscience is a great promoter of cheerfulness for when the conscience is clean the affections are pure but the moving cause of cheerfulness is in the exercise of the virtues especially as they are the ready servants of the joy of loving god yet even the joy of charity is very imperfect and is often troubled unless that charity be patient for it is by the more difficult virtue of patience that we conquer within us what is adverse to cheerfulness suppress our selfish passions and obtain freedom for charity to expand untroubled 
that it may enlarge and fill our souls no one can have perfect cheerfulness without perfect charity or perfect charity without perfect patience who has ever made an effort of will to be patient under trial or temptation who did not find peace and joy in the conquest who has ever upheld his soul with patient resolution above the undercurrent of invading sadness who has not found cheerfulness as the reward of his resolute action let the ignorant speak as their sensuality prompts them we know that those who are the most mortified and patient for the love of god are always the most cheerful and happy their spirit is free their inward sense is drawn to spiritual good they are not encumbered with moodiness their souls delight in god if we had no greater joys than the world can give the body or the body give the soul we should be poor creatures indeed we should be nothing but animals oppressed with the gross shadows of sensual enjoyment which like our bodies are predestined to sufferings and death let us eat and drink to-day for to-morrow we die this is the philosophy of the sensualist most abhorrent to the soul if we had no greater joys than society can give us with its vain rivalries and fictitious sentimentalities we should still be poor creatures our minds and hearts would not have much more to feed on than the uncertain vanities of this uncertain life this is the philosophy of the sentimentalist whose conversation and literature is but too often imbued with subtle poison the great joys of the soul are secret known to heaven unknown to the world what is ambition but a scrambling to rise one over another to the humiliation of our neighbors the confusion of order and the destruction of peace and content this is the philosophy of pride if we had no greater enjoyment than the material scientist can give us we should be unhappy creatures pouring into matter until they lose sight of their immortal souls they materialize their souls and wish to materialize us losing the power of ascending from the creature to the creator by an immense abuse of their intelligence they drown their souls in their senses cast a shadow of gloom and sadness over the world and do their best to make it a dreary habitation for immortal souls they leave the spiritual nature of man without object without purpose without development without meaning without anything immortal with which to satisfy her immortal yearnings but god is infinitely patient religion is the first the grandest the most ennobling of all sciences for it brings us to the fountain of intelligence and wisdom as all other sciences deal with the works of god in their right place they are the servants of religion without his light who made and governs them how can we understand the works of god but with his light they minister to our cheerfulness because they speak of him and lead to him the christian soul lives in communion with god and to that soul a prospect is opened into infinite and unchangeable truth within that soul a sense is opened that tastes the infinite and eternal good what opens this eye in the soul the light of faith descending from god what awakens this sense in the soul the grace of charity from the holy spirit of god can anything be so cheering to the soul as her growth in truth except her growth in good as truth and good come to our soul from god can anything secure their increase like prayer and communion with god by this holy converse hope is ever growing of greater things to come unlike our converse with the world it is inexhaustible in expectation of eternal good add patience to these divine gifts and the restless soul brought to order and tranquillity 
is enabled to profit by these divine visitations to the full of her capacity if nature becomes fatigued by its exaltation above its powers patience steps in to sustain the weary spirit and keep her tranquil and resigned in hope we may be left in a certain obscuration at times but we know that the light is near us we may suffer interior hunger and privation for our trial but we know that god is secretly with us we may feel the weight of trial as a burden but patience will make that burden light and the love that bears it will cheer the soul because it is the joy of sacrifice filled with the hope of eternal good to come the children of the world who live for themselves know nothing of the enjoyments of the children of grace who live for god bent upon the things beneath them their enjoyments come from nothing that is equal to their spiritual nature and certainly from nothing that is superior to that nature and what they do enjoy contains the seeds of sadness and decay loving but mortal things with an immortal soul they pervert the order of their nature until their desires contradict their wants the flowers of their gladness fade and die and the fruits of sadness come in their place they thus detach themselves from the order of the universe separate themselves from the eternal fountain of light life and joy and are reduced to isolation from the god who gives peace and happiness and from the society of the blessed who are happy in god how can they understand those joys of the spirit that spring up to eternal life they are estranged from them by their state of isolation but the spirit of charity carries cheerfulness into every part of life its innocent pleasures and relaxations have the same basis of the love of god as its graver duties so that whilst what is transient in them quickly passes what is divine in the motive lasts for ever the joys of the spirit are like the spirit they have no visible shape by which they can be seen no sensible form by which they can be touched they are joys of the spirit that flow from god's gifts and the soul's virtues they are guarded by patience possessed in god and give a sweet and attractive sense of god spiritual cheerfulness can only belong habitually to the superior soul of those who by loving patience have made the conquest of their inferior nature that its inordinate movements may not mix with the acts of the superior soul to sadden or disturb them what is beneath the superior soul be it the body the senses the animal life or that inferior region of the soul which is in contact with the body all this may be exposed to pains to afflictions or to any kind of suffering but so long as the superior soul is united with god and responds to the ruling of his grace with patient love those sufferings in the region beneath are kept in their place they are looked down upon by the superior soul for what they are and for no more than what they are they are not allowed to invade the superior soul to disturb her peace to make her anxious fretful or distracted or to lessen the cheerfulness of her self-possession and resignation no one without experience can have an idea how much of this detachment of our superior from our inferior nature can be effected by the patient love of god or what power this gives the spirit to command the imagination and the senses enabling the spirit to rise superior to suffering and sadness then that patient love brings those sufferings with a cheerful spirit to christ jesus on the cross where blended with his sufferings they open to her the mysteries of eternal life there seen with wonderful clearness and grace and comfort flow to the sufferer from that life-giving fountain hence st paul has taught us in many places that hope springs from suffering with christ 
and brings joy and consolation to the soul rejoicing in hope patient in tribulation instant in prayer romans chapter twelve verse twelve this interior habit of tranquillity alike in prosperity and adversity shines from the interior into the countenance of the man of patient charity with a bland irradiation a beautiful expression sits like a seal of the holy ghost upon the features of the saints and has often been recorded by those who knew them to give but one example out of thousands st athanasius who was intimately acquainted with st anthony the hermit and knew his austere life and the great patience of his combats with his spiritual enemies tells us in his life of the saint that if any stranger came to see antony although personally unknown to him if he saw him first from a distance and among a crowd of the brethren he recognized the saint the moment he cast eyes on him and would hasten past the others to reach him for his purity of soul shone through his features and the grace of his holy mind was reflected on his earthly frame whilst the cheerfulness of his countenance never failed to show that he was inwardly engaged upon divine things rufinus also informs us that whenever saint antony had to try the spiritual condition of other souls he invariably applied the test of patience hearing that the brethren were extolling one man to the skies for his wonderful virtues st antony sent for him and put his patience to the trial and finding him fail in that virtue he made but small account of the rest and said to him brother you are like a fine house with a very ornamental front door whilst you leave the back door open to thieves if he saw signs of sadness in any one he asked the reason of it and would say no one ought ever to be sad in whom is the salvation of god and the hope of the kingdom of heaven pagans may be sad they have reason to be so and so have unrepenting sinners but let the just rejoice in god this also was one of his sayings there is but one way of conquering the enemy and that is by keeping the spirit cheerful and the mind fixed on god when our hearts are free from envy that deadly bane of charity that shows itself in disparaging speech we find joy in the good which others possess and this makes us partakers of their good but we delight in the good which is united with ourselves delight therefore in its spiritual sense is the pleasure we receive from good obtained but joy is the pleasure we receive from the good we perceive in others or that we expect to receive ourselves for the communion of charity has a breath without limits in which we rejoice or are delighted with all the good we see in god and in all that he gives to ourselves or to our fellow-creatures conscious that by love we are in communion with all that good this joy also moves us to desire that this good may be more and more increased and diffused to the honour of god and the blessing of his creatures but the spiritual gifts that bind us to god are more in god than they are in us and god is the cause of all spiritual joy wherefore st paul exhorts us rejoice in the lord always again i say rejoice philippians chapter four verse four but delight is the enjoyment of good in our actual possession which tranquillizes and satisfies our appetite for good and makes it peaceful pleasant and contented it enlarges the soul into greater life remembering that meekness is the fruit of patience we shall better understand the words of the psalmist the meek shall inherit the land and shall delight in abundance of peace psalm thirty six verse eleven and he says again my soul shall rejoice in the lord and shall be delighted in his salvation psalm thirty four verse nine 
and he shows the reward of this delighting in god delight in the lord and he will give thee the requests of thy heart psalm thirty six verse four our heavenly father loves to see his children free in his love without servile fears he loves to see them trusting in him and rejoicing in him he loves to see them living in the consciousness of his goodness to delight in god is to honor praise and glorify him to delight in god is the effectual way of opening the soul to his divine influences this delight is a bright shadow of the good things to come but to have this calm and cheering sense the heart must habitually look to god live in the sense of god and often converse with him i say converse with god because in that converse the sense of the soul receives the answers to our prayers there are two states of the soul that desires god which are immeasurably different there is a state in which the inward sense of the soul is set on god with humble reverent and devout attention and in which the soul lives more in god than in herself and there is a state in which the soul lives more in herself than in god conscious of god but much more conscious of herself in which state self-love plays a great part the soul finds herself in a net of the earthly senses filled with self-consciousness shadowed with gloom or restless with levity thus imprisoned the soul will imagine that she cannot rise above her nature to seek the cheering light of god nay this self-love in the inferior soul will play shameful tricks with the superior soul will suggest the shame of her faults or the plea of her unworthiness and thus dishearten her from making efforts to rise out of her entanglements or the busy sense and consciousness of self infected with levity or imbued with sadness according to the tone and temper of the time will grasp the heart as with ligaments of fear or with bonds of dullness and make the will reluctant to snap the strings of self-love that the mind may rise to god then prayers are muttered distractedly or murmured painfully within the soul there is no clear outlook above one's self no lifting of the mind no going forth of the heart to god no resting of the affections on god hence cheerlessness impatience and the tendency to sadness but to lend the will to those tricks of self-love that incline the soul to unreasonable fears and sadness is unworthy of a child of god who ought to cherish unbounded confidence in a father of such unbounded goodness and ought to foster that unbounded confidence which inspires generosity for what has self-love ever done for us that is not to our shame and discouragement and what has the confiding love of god ever done for us that is not to our joy and content true faith knows the unbounded goodness and mercy of god and how ready he is at all times to accept our good will true humility knows what infirm creatures we are and how our heavenly father is disposed to help us in our infirmities whatever they may be provided we have recourse to him true patience withstands all the fears and misgivings of self-love that interfere with hope and adheres with unbounded trust to the divine helper of our infirmities the true love of god however humbled is never ashamed to bring every weakness and failing before our heavenly father gladly knowing that he expects this of us and that to open the soul to him is to secure pardon light and peace wait on god with patience join thyself to god and endure that thy life may be increased end of lecture twelve part one lecture twelve part two of christian patience 
by william bernard ullathorne this librivox recording is in the public domain lecture twelve on the cheerfulness of patience part two only those souls that are disciplined in the patience of charity can be truly cheerful under grave trials for this depends upon the magnanimity with which the spirit upholds herself above the pressure and pain of her inferior nature and this can only be done by the brave and patient love of the spirit which looks to god and by virtue of the trust which that love inspires that if we are resigned to the trial god will show us a way out of it and will deliver us from it in his own good time cheerfulness implies hope courage confidence in god the turning a deaf ear to the complaints of self-love and a certain modest joy in the consciousness that in the hands of god in whom we live and move and have our being we are safe but when we are beset by serious trials a certain effort of patience is required to keep the spirit uppermost and to keep the door closed through which sadness would invade the soul yet is it surprising to any one who tries with what a small amount of effort on the part of the will this cheerfulness when lost may be recovered and how much evil and discomfort this cheerful spirit will prevent no one should allow his peace to be disturbed by what is not a rebuke of conscience there are a number of pious people who greatly injure their freedom as well as their cheerfulness by attaching unquiet feelings to their conscience without cause and make themselves miseries out of their own fancies brooding over their dull or unpleasant sensations or over little things said about them they indulge in the art of self-torment and make such a set of discomforts for themselves that nothing works at ease in them and they can neither rejoice in god nor be cheerful in themselves yet these discomforts may be nothing more than humours in the body or little irritations in the nerves that are not worth attention or depression caused by change in the atmosphere or some obstruction or other in the corporal system or something of sadness allowed to be engendered from annoyance of no moment yet these good people will mistake these petty disturbances or depressions of their sensibilities for something wrong in the conscience they know not what which engages them with themselves alarms them with apprehensions and fills them with uneasiness but these and similar things have no relation whatever in their origin with the will or the conscience and only become a mischief by being made the subject of a great deal of self-consciousness and self-love wearing and wasting the spirits in discomfort sadness and discouragement this is not the way of patience but of impatience not the way of peace but of trouble not the way of the cheerful giver but of the selfish self-disturber the generous soul sets her heart on god not on herself thinks of god and not of her own mechanical discomforts if any one should take this brooding over himself for self-knowledge he would be very much mistaken he is simply making discouragements for himself by looking for them and so conjuring them up self-knowledge is not to be found in our own darkness but in god's light there is an immense deal of selfishness in this dull and dreary self-introspection excepting when we examine ourselves before god and in his light peace of conscience should not be disturbed by venial weaknesses they cause no surprise in humble souls that have a sincere disposition to reform them nor should venial faults of the will be allowed to disturb its patience and so open the door to sadness causing irritating frets instead of peaceful regrets for as st bonaventure observes if we keep our patience it will remove our sins of weakness 
and the council of trent teaches that there is no obligation of confessing these venial sins because every good act is removing them it is commended but not required a good act of the love of god or for the love of god will do more to remove them than the fretting and disconsolation and shame at failure which have less of contrition than self-love in them and are therefore more offensive than the mere faults of surprise weakness or inadvertence from which this interior disturbance has been allowed to rise beware of that shame humiliation and self-disturbance which is neither humility patience nor contrition it is good to have sincere contrition for even the least of our faults and to submit them to the tribunal of penance but they ought not to injure our cheerfulness because that is to injure our childlike confidence in god without failures of which we are conscious and that help to keep us humble we should have deeper sins of pride of which we should be less conscious trials of darkness and dryness are not to be assumed for proofs of the presence of sin but as demands on patience and resignation if on examination the conscience is silent they have no other object than to strengthen us in the more solid virtues such as faith trust patience humility detachment and resignation the peace of a good conscience inspires cheerfulness under all trials because god in his goodness has enabled us to keep the great points of his law in the words of st paul we glory in this the testimony of our conscience that in simplicity of heart and sincerity of god and not in carnal wisdom but in the grace of god we have conversed in this world two corinthians chapter one verse twelve there is another error of judgment seldom noticed but a not unfrequent cause of interior discouragement a soul that has had a long and trying conflict with interior darkness temptation or trial will suffer fatigue and weariness and may even mistake the consequent depression for a wound in the conscience the will may have been firm and patient but the fatigue will be all the greater from the strain let not that soul mistake the depression of fatigue either for sadness or reproach of conscience a little tranquil recollection raising the spirit above the exhausted sense will restore her cheerfulness nothing contributes more to cheerfulness than the habit of looking at the good side of things the good side is god's side of them but even on their human side what makes them appear worse than they are is conferred on them by the envy jealousy and malice of our hearts falsely imagining that what depresses others exalts ourselves this is one of the most false and miserable of human weaknesses the evil it produces is incalculable for what begins in the jealousy of the heart ends in the scandal of the tongue inordinate self-love is never without the inclination to exalt one's dear self at the expense of others and to take a secret enjoyment out of their humiliation hence comes the disposition to look to the weak rather than the good side of persons and things and hence the habit of rash judgment making things appear much worse than they are let patience keep down envy and repress the fancy of our own superiority and we shall see a great deal more for which to praise god that will make us more cheerful and thankful for all good is from god and is to his honour and praise wherever we find a single-hearted catholic people full of faith their constant praising of god for all the good they see or receive forms the most beautiful element of their language but the pleasure of seeing and imagining what is wrong or imprudent in our neighbours indicates a jealous disposition of soul that is fruitful in uncharity and evil 
why should we not rejoice in the good things of god we can rejoice in the good things of the senses why not in the good things of the soul if the day is pure and serene we enjoy its gladness why should we not rejoice in the serene light of truth that shines from heaven upon our mind if the sun warms us with his beneficent rays our whole frame is cheerful why should we not be cheerful under the radiation of god's divine charity if we look at beautiful flowers or hear delightful music our heart expands with pleasure why should not our soul expand with delight when god puts beautiful flowers of grace into our souls or gives us a sense of the eternal harmonies we find a joy in the presence and cheerful greeting of our friends why should we not look up to heaven when so many pure and most loving faces look upon us with divine affection and with most tender desires to cheer and help us we feel honored and cheered by the arrival of beautiful gifts chiefly because they are embalmed with the kind affections of our friends why should we not delight in the beautiful gifts of god so many so frequent so various bringing to our soul the celestial balsam of his eternal love having an almighty and most loving father in whom we live and move and have our being let us rejoice in him having a most loving saviour very god of god who has made himself our brother and feeds us with his life we ought surely to rejoice in him having the holy spirit of god with us dwelling in us with wonderful condescension making us his temples and pouring his love into our hearts we ought certainly to answer his love and rejoice in his overflowing goodness rejoice in the lord always again i say rejoice sensual joy is from a mortal cause and we soon find out its mortality spiritual joy is from a spiritual and eternal cause and nothing but sin or sadness can bring it to an end in us for true spiritual delight springs from the divine truth in the intelligence and the divine love in the will and is pure simple innocent peaceful contenting to the spirit and filled with the promise of eternal good things why should we ever set a gloomy face against a guest so beautiful and generous that heavenly guest will never disturb us will never derange the good order of our being as sensual pleasures do but will give the soul in which it dwells a sweet growth a tranquil energy and a loving cheerfulness proportioned to the welcome that we give to a guest so divine and as st thomas truly observes this spiritual cheerfulness perfects the work of the will by giving pleasure to its operations as every spiritual good that we receive comes from the eternal fountain of happiness when gratefully received and rightly used it ought to promote that cheerfulness which is the beginning of all happiness for what the book of wisdom tells us of the manna with which god fed the israelites in the wilderness is applicable to every divine gift thou didst feed the people with the food of angels and gavest them bread from heaven prepared without labour having in it all that is delightful and the sweetness of every taste for thy sustenance showed thy sweetness and serving every man's will it was turned to what every man liked wisdom chapter sixteen verses twenty and twenty one but whether we shall taste the varied and abundant sweetness of those heavenly gifts or not depends upon what patient control we exercise over our earthly desires and sensual appetites which hinder us from relishing divine and eternal things when the israelites lost this control and longed for the flesh-pots of egypt their souls nauseated the food that god had provided for them and they fell into a sadness and a murmuring with which god was greatly offended 
of what profit are the divinest gifts unless we give our heart and will to them how can they make us cheerful if we prefer the sadness that sensual self-love engenders then as we have said from st bonaventure the patience of charity purifies the soul from sin which is the chief obstacle to cheerfulness and here we will give the whole teaching of the seraphic doctor on this important subject and that nearly in his own words first patience purifies the soul from past sins and by keeping the will apart from those temptations that move us to sin it preserves us from future sins patience effects this by holding back the will from entering into temptation secondly by keeping the soul in just order regularity and peace patience disposes us for the receiving of greater graces and diviner gifts and prepares us for the exercise of stronger virtues thirdly patience tests and proves all the virtues for as st gregory says the trials of a man prove what is in him gold is purified from dross in the fire the grain of iron is tested by the file wheat is separated from straw by the flail what is false or defective in the soul is cast out by patience fourthly the patient soul perfects her charity to a high degree and obtains greater glory in heaven she therefore welcomes the sufferings that give occasion for exercising this virtue that she may be able to say with the psalmist according to the multitude of my sorrows in my heart thy comforts have given joy to my soul psalm ninety three verse nineteen fifthly when patience works by charity the soul is prudent in the ruling of herself strenuous in combating for her own protection and reigns like a peaceful sovereign in her own domain of which she holds free and firm possession whilst by her calm vigour she becomes the mistress of her adversaries sixthly patience is a singular retributor of the passion of christ it repays him in kind for what we receive from him who bore our sorrows this is the special joy of the saints whatever comes to them in likeness to the sufferings of christ that they welcome that they suffer with patience and rejoice in their sufferings they rejoice because they have opportunities of repaying the lord as far as they are able for the exceeding love with which he gave his life for them not that he is in need of our goods who have none of our own to give him but when he enters into judgment with us and we come before him with the marks of his sufferings upon us then will they have great confusion who have had no will to suffer for his sake and they will have great glory who have endured much with patience for the love of him it would seem then that our lord shows special love to those to whom he sends many things to be endured he honours them with a part of his burden as he honoured simon of cyrene with a part of his cross a number of persons each with his own burden are travelling the same road in company if one of them gets exhausted with fatigue he will naturally look to some one on whose affection he can rely to help him for a time with his burden he will trust to love and not to the grudging help of those to whom he is indifferent so our divine lord walking with us all the days of our lives looks out for those who are ready for his love to carry a part of the burden that he still must bear in his mystical body the church he distributes that passion which as our head he endured for us among his faithful and compassionate members who being of the body of which he is the head love to suffer with him that with him they may be glorified for as the sufferings of christ abound in us so also shall his glory abound partaking of his death 
we partake also of his resurrection and the more we suffer with him the more gloriously shall we reign with him when the royal psalmist is in affliction and his life is wasted with grief he exclaims to god o oh, how great is the multitude of thy sweetness o lord which thou hast hidden for them that fear thee which thou hast wrought for them that hope in thee in the sight of the sons of men thou shalt hide them in the secret of thy face from the disturbance of men thou shalt protect them in thy tabernacle from the contradiction of tongues psalm thirty verses twenty and twenty one among the treasures of his goodness god has provided an unspeakable sweetness for those who fear him with a loving fear and a singular protection for those who in patient hope refer the trials and contradictions they endure to their divine protector the psalmist has before him two states of soul the state of one who seeks god in solitude and silence and the state of one who is exposed to the combats and vexations of the active life and the contradiction of tongues the souls that seek god in silence he hides in his face and gives them a divine intimacy with him a great sweetness is hidden for those souls which is sometimes given to them and sometimes concealed from them when this luminous sweetness is communicated it fills them with delight when it is concealed from them it is not lost but is hidden in the secret of god's face for them that their faith may be exercised their patience put to the proof and their desire of god increased the law of justice is in their heart but there is a cloud before them yet they know that the son of justice is in the cloud then sensible delight is changed into a secret sustaining strength and they wait in the outer court in the root of the soul there is hope desire and a chaste fear that is not afraid of god but where is the source of cheerfulness in the faith that god is in the cloud and very near the soul in the confidence that the sweetness is not lost but only hidden in the face of god for them in the trust that their trial is purifying them for greater good in the courage that still adheres to god with patience and waits his will with magnanimity meanwhile it is ordained that the soul prove her love by the constancy of her patience and wait in peace until consolation returns two things try the patience of the soul set in open combat persecution in their persons or goods and provoking offensive or calumnious speeches but when they silently commit their cause to god and patiently leave themselves to his care he protects their souls from injury and hides them in his tabernacle or sanctuary words that signify their secret union with him in which he shows them special favors and proofs of tenderness to those who are in the charity of god st paul addresses these magnificent words know you not that your members are the temple of the holy ghost who is in you whom you have from god and you are not your own for you were bought with a great price one corinthians chapter six verses nineteen and twenty and in another place the apostle tells us whosoever are led by the spirit of god they are the sons of god for you have not received the spirit of bondage again in fear but you have received the adoption of sons whereby we cry abba father for the spirit giveth testimony to our spirit that we are the sons of god and if sons heirs also heirs indeed of god and joint heirs with christ yet so if we suffer with him that we may be also glorified with him romans chapter eight verses fourteen through seventeen here is a list of most noble prerogatives and privileges that belong to the lovers of god they are delivered from servile fear 
they are free with that freedom with which god makes them free they have the joy of being god's children a joy that should remove all sadness from their hearts they are the living temples of god's holy spirit who bears them witness that they are the sons of god they are joint heirs with christ of the good things of god but one condition is attached to these exalted privileges yet so if we suffer with him that we may also be glorified with him this condition is required for proof and for earnest that we do love god with sincere affection and gratitude and are ready to suffer with cheerfulness for his sake who bought us this love with his sufferings and as our present sufferings prepare us for the future glory they ought already to have in them the seeds of that glory in the cheerfulness and joy that comes of the patient love with which we suffer why should the children of god raise the question in fear and sadness that they know not whether they love god or not you know whether you prefer god to all things else you know whether you desire god above all things you know whether you would consent to die rather than offend him mortally you know whether trusting in his grace you are ready to suffer with christ it is these dispositions of the will and not the emotions of sensibility that decide the question whether you love god or not why then should you deprive yourself of the cheering joy of loving god why should you check and restrain the expansion of that love with saddening thoughts and servile fears the apostles and saints give us the maxim that the proof of the presence of charity is in its patience when we are ready and cheerfully ready to suffer and to endure for the love of god we have the full proof of the presence of that love in our soul why should the sacred scriptures exhort us so continually to rejoice in god to delight in god and to rejoice in suffering for his sake if we are to turn a deaf ear to them as though they were not the revealed will of god to our faith as though they were not his own divine invitations that we should love and serve him cheerfully to rejoice in god is to put his enemies to flight the cheerful love and service of god disperse gloom scatter morbidity to the winds and leave no room for self-love to indulge in sadness nor need this cheerfulness be lowered by the advent of tribulation if patience be there to sustain the spirit in its right position we may always rejoice observes st chrysostom if we will only keep our heads a little raised above the flood of human things end of lecture twelve part two lecture twelve part three of christian patience by william bernard ullathorne this librivox recording is in the public domain lecture twelve on the cheerfulness of patience part three cheerfulness is the beauty of patience the play of freedom the radiation of charity the glow of spiritual health it is an emanation from the gifts and the fruits of the holy ghost and a certain sign of the happy order of the virtues braced into the love of god by peace-giving patience the cheerful spirit this joy of devotedness completes and perfects our acts in the service of god and of our neighbours it crowns our good deeds and without it they are without their best ornament when our good acts are accompanied with reluctance or constraint they lose their freedom power and influence because they are mingled with pain and sadness it is said in the ethics which gives us the voice of nature that the generous man who expends his gifts joyfully does a noble action whereas he who gives reluctantly and with regret does an unworthy deed 
Holy Scripture proclaims that to serve God with joy and gladness makes our service acceptable. It was said to the Israelites, Because thou didst not serve the Lord thy God with joy and gladness of heart, for the abundance of all things, thou shalt serve thy enemy, whom the Lord will send upon thee in hunger and thirst and nakedness and in the want of all things. Deuteronomy chapter 28 verses 47 and 48 This was their punishment for not serving God gratefully but grudgingly. The sacred psalmist exhorts us, Serve ye the Lord with gladness. Psalm 99 verse 2 and he gives it as the blessing of the hopeful. Let all them be glad who hope in thee. They shall rejoice for ever, and thou shalt dwell in them. Psalm 5, verse 12. If the Old Testament abounds in exhortations to serve God with cheerfulness and with joy, the New Testament is even yet more instant in exhorting us to be cheerful and thankful under sufferings and trials whoever suffered more than st paul yet he tells the corinthians i exceedingly abound in joy in all our tribulations two corinthians chapter seven verse four in which of his epistles does he not proclaim his joy amidst his sufferings profoundly conscious that they bound him to the cross of christ and the love of god st peter gives a sublime reason for this joy and suffering if you partake of the sufferings of christ rejoice that when his glory shall be revealed you also may be glad with exceeding joy one peter chapter four verse thirteen but the most touching instruction is that of our blessed lord after his last supper he tells his disciples that he is going to leave them he describes all the sufferings that will come upon them after his departure he then says to them peace i leave with you my peace i give unto you not as the world giveth do i give unto you let not your heart be troubled nor let it be afraid and after exhorting them to abide in him and in his love he says to them these things i have spoken to you that my joy may be in you, and your joy may be filled. St. John chapter 15, verse 11. How joy meets suffering on the ground of patience, St. Augustine will explain. Expounding the text of the psalm, My bone is not hidden from thee, which thou hast made in secret. He asks, What is this bone that is known to God, but hidden from man? It is a certain interior firmness and fortitude that is not easily broken down. Whatever troubles, whatever trials or adversities come upon us, God has made a firmness within us that neither yields nor breaks under them. This firmness is a certain patience that God forms within us, and of which the psalmist says, Shall not my soul be subject to God? for from him is my patience. The apostle had this firmness, sorrowful as it were, yet always rejoicing. The persecutors strove their best to make the martyrs miserable, and judging them by their own weakness, they thought them miserable. To the eyes of men they seemed in a miserable plight, but within themselves they rejoiced in God to whom the bone was not hidden that he had made for them. The man born blind has no sense of colors. The man born deaf has no knowledge of the sound of the human voice. The fishes that live in the waters have no experience of fire. The body has eyes, but they cannot see the soul. Man without the grace and virtue of patient charity can form no true conception how peace and joy can coexist with great pain and suffering. It is not sensually, but spiritually examined. But in the case supposed, this union of joy with suffering is not in the soul to be examined, 
nor in the spiritual power there by which it can be examined the gifts of the holy ghost give the joy and the power to feel the joy where god acts and the soul acts with god human weakness is not the point for consideration but divine strength and the grace of patient charity is stronger than all suffering hence a saint felicitous could cheerfully encourage her seven sons to look up to heaven where jesus christ expected them to be faithful in their love and suffer bravely for their souls with joy she saw them expire in torments one after another and then followed them on their ensanguined path to heaven a saint agnes so young and tender surveyed the cruel fire and the instruments of torture with a cheerful countenance expressed her joy at the spectacle and still more at the sight of her barbarous executioner and went more cheerfully to her sufferings than other maidens to their bridals a saint lawrence could playfully jest with his executioners in the midst of his cruel torments a sir thomas more could calmly use his gentle wit at the moment of laying his head upon the block when saint tibertius was sentenced to bitter tortures before the death-stroke he said to the judge to the christian whose conscience is pure all your torments are but trifles the acts of the holy martyrs and confessors abound in evidence of the consolations that carried them through their sufferings in return for their patient love god gave them the hidden bone of fortitude and the refreshment of his holy spirit and they experienced the truth of the eternal promise he shall cry to me and i will hear him i am with him in tribulation i will deliver him and glorify him psalm ninety verse fifteen but after all our greatest trials are interior those that come from without are open palpable and definable in their causes but those within are often obscure and mysterious they go to the very core of our affections and to the inexperienced they cause anxiety and solicitude owing to the privation of light and of sensible joy yet are they the most important part of the discipline of the soul they correct negligence punish conceit and pride and are very often trials of fidelity they are at all times great instructions in self-knowledge humility and patience under this kind of trial the wants of the soul are keenly felt our nothingness before god is keenly impressed upon us our dependence on god is struck deeply into the conscience and the craving of the heart for god is so much awakened that where patience is truly present self-love which is the greatest enemy to spiritual cheerfulness and joy is in great measure purified from the soul what shall we say to those who are in the first experiences of this kind of trial let them first understand that such trials are not exceptional but common to souls called to greater perfection of life first comes the season of flowering then the season of the hard and unripe fruit and afterwards the mellowing of the fruit into sweetness we first enjoy the beauty and perfume of the blossoms but they must decay before the fruit can come the time of flowering is the novitiate of the soul then comes the hard acid and unripe fruit this is the time of patience and hope of strengthening and maturing but during all this time of patient endurance the hard dry and acid fruit is being strengthened in its virtues increased and ripened by the sun into sweetness and perfection and then we enjoy its matured beauty and nourishing sweetness with delight it is unreasonable to expect the ripe fruit in the time of flowering or in the time of maturing yet we may be cheered with their beauty and their promise and with the hope of greater enjoyment in the future 
there is no present good of the spiritual kind without the promise of greater good and even of eternal good the trial is the pruning of the tree of its harmful superfluities giving it strength and vigor to be fruitful know that you must pass from the flower to the green fruit of piety and that the fruit must be hardened before it is ripened do not frighten your imagination as if yours were an exceptional and singular case your books of instruction will tell you differently look not to your sensibilities as if true piety consisted in them but look well to your will and desires in the winter season of your soul fret not the summer's sunshine you are soft and must be hardened it is the season of patience of resignation of waiting of enduring why should not your winter be cheerfully undergone there is nothing to prevent it if by patient love you keep sadness away the great enemy of the soul is not trial but sadness which is the bleeding wound of self-love it takes many shapes and many shades of color all of the darker hues and is often subtle and unperceived in its depressing influence it is fertile of evils chokes a great deal of good resists the operations of divine grace and is the great adversary of cheerfulness it contracts the heart darkens the mind and insinuates the morbid elements of self-love like a virulent poison into the soul shall we call it blood poisoning or soul poisoning it is both it is noxious to the whole spirit of life natural as well as supernatural there are but two remedies for this malignant evil the preventative remedy is in that patience of will that resists its entrance into the soul from the outset and by adhering to god keeps the spirit from descending into the entanglements of self-love but when sadness has arisen has got some hold of the will and already caused some moodiness and trouble the remedy will be in an effort to break through the slimy net in which the spirit has become entangled as the effect of sadness is to close us up within ourselves the short way of deliverance is to break away from oneself and this by some act of kindness and attention to others this will be a reluctant effort at first but with a little effort to overcome reluctance self-conquest and freedom will be quickly gained and it will be discovered with surprise that there was nothing in this contemptible moodiness but pride for self-love was entertaining a resolve to be unhappy and will feel the humiliation of giving up the dark conceit which was nothing but the dregs of self nothing but the bitter consciousness of nature warped to sullenness whilst the effort to be cheerful and kind is in fact the separation of the will from self-love to which it clings like a limpet to a rock not because it is happiness but because it is self yet no humiliation imposed by another could be more severely felt than this tearing away the will from one's morbid self it is like giving up a fortress it looks like something too strong to conquer yet nothing can be weaker all that is required to break the fascinating spell is some little effort of the will and it is amazing how small is the effort required a few kind words a kind act even a kind look though reluctant at first will set the will free and dissolve the gloomy phantoms that have held the soul in bondage then will patient charity recover her ascendancy and will open first the green bud and then the bright flower of cheerfulness giving graciousness and beauty to the virtues let us conclude these instructions the heart is the centre of our corporal life from which every member of the body receives its renovation the calm regular and musical time of its pulsations gives us the best assurance we can have 
that our material frame is in a healthy condition in virtue of those steadfast and constant pulsations every part of the body receives fresh elements of life and rejects what is noxious or destructive of life the will in like manner is the centre of our spiritual nature the spring and fountain of its action hence the scriptures place the heart for the will which is truly the vital principle of the soul the principle of action love and endurance but there is this essential difference between the spring of our material and the spring of our spiritual life that the material heart acts by a fixed law that is independent of the will but the spiritual heart or font of action is the will which is free in its action and formed to work with the supernatural grace of god but among the divine gifts of grace there are two chief principles of power and when the will works faithfully with them they give the soul that perfection of life which prepares her for her final union with god the one is the fervid and generous action of charity the other is the regulating and controlling action of patience this last power is essential for the protection and defence of the first so long as we are in this mortal state of trial and probation not charity alone not patience alone but the charity which is patient prepares the soul for god as the twofold movement of the heart gives the action that renews life and the action which repels what is injurious to life the movement of charity brings life and the movement of patience repels what is injurious to life the charity of the will makes the whole man charitable and holy the patience of the will makes the whole man strong and peaceful the custody of the heart is the custody of the man and this custody of the heart is the work of patience when the will is patient the mind is patient the heart is patient the tongue is patient the hand is patient when the will is patient charity is patient and all the virtues are patient but this implies the exercise of a tranquil violence over our restless and wayward nature of which our lord tells us the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent bear it away st matthew chapter eleven verse twelve what is weak and restless in our nature looks to patience for strength and consistency and we must reign over ourselves before we can enter our saviour's kingdom to the angels the heavens are natural because they are pure spirits but before the heavens can be natural to us a great change must be effected in us yet as st jerome observes he who is created man desires to be an angel the earthly man seeks a heavenly habitation heavenly grace must work the change and be woven by the will into our nature through the virtues but this cannot be effected without doing violence to the appetites the passions and irascibilities of our nature which patience accomplishes through the instrumentality of the virtues quelling the disorders that resist the light of god and the operations of his grace and that oppose the free flowing of celestial charity which prepares us for the atmosphere of heaven and the most delightful vision of god as a last word of encouragement to the cultivators of patience it may be well to point out once more how the closing book of the sacred scriptures ascribes the whole victory of the saints to their patience here says st john is the patience of the saints who keep the commandments of god and the faith of jesus apocalypse chapter fourteen verse twelve from the island of patmos st john salutes us and calls himself our brother and our partner in tribulation in the kingdom and the patience of christ 
and he makes known to us the visions he has seen and the voices he has heard proclaiming the rewards of them who overcome themselves the world and the evil spirits by their patience the beloved evangelist beholds in a sublime vision the son of god in his glory arrayed as the eternal bishop and pastor of his church and records his words to the churches on earth he that hath an ear let him hear what the spirit saith to the churches to him that overcometh i will give to eat of the tree of life which is in the paradise of my god apocalypse chapter two verse seven he that shall overcome shall not be hurt by the second death apocalypse chapter two verse eleven he that overcometh i will give him the hidden manna and will give him a white counter and in the counter a new name written which no man knoweth but he that receiveth it apocalypse chapter two verse seventeen the white counter or hidden manna is the holy eucharist of the glorified body and blood of the lord the white counter is an allusion to the ivory symbol bearing the name of the donor which men of distinction gave to their friends as a claim to their hospitality and it here signifies a claim to the hospitality of christ in his eternal kingdom that which you have hold fast till i come and he that shall overcome and keep my words unto the end i will give him power over the nations apocalypse chapter two verse twenty six he that shall overcome shall thus be clothed in white garments and i will not blot out his name out of the book of life and i will confess his name before my father and before his angels apocalypse chapter three verse five because thou hast kept the word of my patience i also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon the whole world to try them that dwell upon the earth behold i come quickly hold fast that which thou hast that no man take away thy crown he that shall overcome i will make him a pillar in the temple of my god and he shall go out no more and i will write upon him the name of my god and the name of the city of my god the new jerusalem which cometh down out of the heaven of my god and my new name apocalypse chapter three verses ten through twelve i counsel thee to buy of me gold fire tried that thou mayest be rich and mayest be clothed in white garments and that the shame of thy nakedness may not appear and anoint thy eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see such as i love i rebuke and chastise be thou zealous therefore and do penance behold i stand at the gate and knock if any man shall hear my voice and open to me the door i will come to him and will sup with him and he with me to him that shall overcome i will give to sit with me on my throne as i also have overcome and am set down with my father in his throne apocalypse chapter three verses eighteen through twenty and he showed me a river of water of life clear as crystal proceeding from the throne of god and the lamb in the midst of the street thereof and on both sides of the river was the tree of life bearing twelve fruits yielding its fruits every month and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations and there shall be no curse any more but the throne of god and of the lamb shall be in it and his servants shall serve him and they shall see his face and his name shall be on their foreheads and night shall be no more and they shall not need the light of the lamp nor the light of the sun because the lord god shall enlighten them and they shall reign for ever and ever and he said to me these words are most faithful and true apocalypse chapter twenty two verses one through six behold i come quickly and my reward is with me 
to render to every man according to his works apocalypse chapter twenty two verse twelve end of lecture twelve part three end of christian patience by william bernard ullathorne